getting yourself just to, to move in a situation where you don't want to move is oftentimes all it takes. And then you kind of get into it, you know, again, to that attitude piece, like you can just get yourself to go, Hey, this is something that's going to make me my 1% better today and just get yourself to start it. It usually kicks in. All right. I'm here with Rich Lamborn. Rich, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, Rich. Whew. You have an awesome bio here. You went to BYU. You majored in Japanese. You're the starting outside hitter for the program's first ever NCAA national championship. You play pro indoor for all kinds of different teams in different countries. You have uh, world tour gold medals, Norseka gold medals. You're a two-time Olympian and an Olympic gold medalist for Team USA in 2008. You're the current coach of Taylor Crabb and Jake Gibb, USA's number one ranked team on the beach. You also have broadcasting experience for the AVP on Amazon Prime. Uh, your IG is at Richie USA. That's at R-I-C-H-Y-U-S-A. Rich Lamborn. Thanks again, bud. That was well done. <laughs> Pseudo important. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll jump into the first question. What does living an inspired life mean to you? Yeah, uh, I was going to, in our little uh, pre-briefing, I was, I was going to tell you, I appreciate you sending me those questions because uh, like this, this way that you think about things is, is a little bit, not foreign, but like new to me because that's, I feel like a more modern term, this inspired living concept. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know that I've ever really um, thought about it in that terminology. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. like to, to me, living an inspired life, I guess, would be surrounding yourself with people who are better than you. Love that's that. something you aspire to. Love that. Uh, you, you know, and I mean, that can be in all facets of life. Somebody who's nicer than you, somebody who's smarter than you, somebody who's more talented in, in some arena than you. Um, because I think uh, maybe we get into this a little bit later in the, in the conversation about, you know, quotes and stuff that are inspiring, but we always used to have a mantra with our OA team that if you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Right. And so uh, being surrounded by people that will elevate you in some way, I, I think would be a way to live an inspired life. I absolutely love that. You know, uh, Rich, this project is called The Tools Within, and it's for athletes um, who are, you know, w the whole goal is to try to inspire them in and out of the game. Because I think now more than ever, you know, um, living an inspired life, both as an athlete and just in regular life is extremely important. Yeah. You know? And and so, yeah, so these are all about tools. And I, I want to carry that further into practice. You know, um, what, what does having an inspired practice mean to you? Well, first of all, let me comment on the title of your, your project, The sure. Tools Within. I think if you were to poll most of my teammates, uh, they would unilaterally say that I was the tool within the team. So <laughs> um, it's good to have me on, <laughs> on this subject. Awesome. <laughs> uh, what, what does that mean in practice? Do, do you mean like, sporting practice or how do I enact that concept in my daily life? Right, right. Great question. Yeah, I, I actually would love, love to hear both. Um, you know, if, uh, and uh, first as a player, you know, and with all your indoor experience and now as a coach to the number one ranked team in the United States. All right. Well, so here again, uh, I'm going to refer a lot to, to my USA squad in, in 2008, uh, yeah. just because that was kind of the highlight, certainly in the, the pinnacle of my career and kind of the situation that shaped a lot of my beliefs. And so, you know, and that, and I attribute that in large part, not only to the group of guys we had, but, but mainly to Hugh McCutcheon, who was our coach with that squad and just kind of his, his genius and his intelligence and his, um, ability to to plan and enact plans and sort of build and shape us as a group and so uh one of his things was 
that greatness is not a switch. Uh, you know, oftentimes I think, especially like if you happen to be really talented or if you're playing, you know, somebody below your talent level, let's say, you don't give it your full effort sometimes, you know, or you go into practice, you're having a rough day and you go, oh, I can take it easy here. I'll just turn it on when it's game time. And one of our beliefs uh, one of the things that Hugh would tell us and certainly something that I believe is that that's not a switch. You know, you end up playing how you practice. And so practice is so vital, not only in creating routines for yourself, which I think we'll get into a little bit more later also, but uh, in just, I, I don't know, you can't make the game look different than the training you've done. Right. So you need to train day in and day out the way you want to be capable of playing you know when things are on i love that it's just wins or whether it's an olympic yeah and you were saying about you know having an inspired practice and and how it's not basically you can't just switch it on and off i love that you, ha you have to kind of earn it so to speak um over time right is that kind of what you mean well yeah and it's and it's just that i i can't dog it in one arena and expect to you know pay have it pay dividends my practice pay dividends when it really matters because that may work sometimes you know uh but you want to have the confidence that you've trained to where you know what to expect from yourself no matter the situation right and you like like a navy seal mantra that i've heard repeatedly that i like that it's you know ap applicable here maybe is you don't rise to the occasion, you fall back to the level of your training, which is why they train so meticulously and so incessantly, because you can't just go career when bullets are flying at you and your life's right. on the You just, you revert to whatever level you've trained yourself to. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, I think that applies to sports on a much uh, less life and death <laughs> kind of scale, fortunately. But, uh, sure. you know, the concept is still legitimate, I think. Absolutely. Well, what about an uninspired practice? Because I know that happens sometimes. Um, how does that feel? And what are some tools that you can offer to snap right back out, right back out of that and get back to an inspired practice? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know that I have a tool necessarily. I, I think that it's a choice mentally. Um, you know, the the way we would express it would be mindful repetition. Mm. Uh, you know, you, we've all been in situations like you're pointing out here where we've just gone through the motion or had mindless repetition. But again, that's something that can and should be trained. I'm going to go into this practice with the mentality that your thing on your, on your website and your emails and stuff, right. Is 1%. Uh, that's a great concept. I mean, that's, very uh, aspirational yeah i got <laughs> it right that, here too <laughs> yeah yeah it's a, i think it's a good statement because while i would argue that that's impossible to actually accomplish it feels like something i can do it's not this mountain of hey i'm an a-level beach player i want to be like phil dollhauser <laughs> or jake gibb or something right like the the grand canyon of space between me and him so daunting that I might never even get started on that road. But if I just go, Hey, I want to be 1% better every day. And in a year, I'm going to be 365% better. And you know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I started rambling and now I forgot what the question is. No, but, it's okay. Uh, it's all good. No, I, repetition, right? mindful repetition. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Um, you know, I guess the next thing I want to ask you is, um, What's the main difference between an inspired practice and an inspired game? Because they are different because, you know, there's a scoreboard and there's a, there's, you know, there's winning and losing and all that stuff. But the mindful repetition is kind of similar. So what is the main difference? Between an inspired practice and an inspired game? Yeah. Uh, yeah and, 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 and while you're thinking about that, how does one carry over to the other? Because that's really what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, well, I would think that, uh, I mean, my answer is going to be kind of the same as, as what we talked about here. I have to train myself 
through inspired practice in order to give myself an opportunity to have an inspired game. Right. There's, right. there's no, there's no guarantee of an inspired game. Right. But I, I think I can always have an inspired practice on some level in that I can always give my best effort. I can always have a, a proper attitude and you know, I can always, there are certain controllables. There are certain things that, you know, we can have under our control to a certain extent. Those two that I just mentioned, the um, effort and the attitude, yeah. but also communication is one that I can control, right? Absolutely. So those are things that I have to train. And those are ways that I can have a, an inspired practice. Daily, right, right. right? I can control those things. I'm not, I can't control the level of my play, unfortunately. I'm going to, I'm going to fluctuate a little bit there. And the reason I'm practicing and the reason I'm controlling all the other things that I can control is so that I can minimize the variation in the level of my play. Right. And so the more I can have those inspired practices and groove that into me, the more likely I am to have an inspired game. Love that. <clears throat> I love that. Oh, uh, let's move into mindset, Rich. Can you give us a little glimpse of your mindset again as a player and a coach um, uh, pre, during, and post training sessions and games? Just give us a glimpse of your mindset. My mindset? Yeah. Uh, I know it's a general kind of thing, but yeah, just, just any, anything that comes to mind. Well, to, to kind of piggyback on that uh, control the controllables yeah. idea, uh, I, I like a mindset and I, I think, you know, when I say we, I mean me and Jake and Taylor as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, most often prefer to focus on our side of the net, things that we want to do, things that are under our control and how we can kind of minimize that, that variation in the game. Um, so that's kind of our mindset going in. And then we have to have <clears throat> a bit of an adaptive mindset during the game. Ah, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we go in with a game plan. Okay, say we're playing Phil and Nick. We, we say we want to do X, Y, and Z to start. And mm -hmm. then we've constantly got to be doing some sort of uh, math in our head as to whether or not this is working. Sorry, I don't, working. Mean to, I don't mean to cut you off. I think you're blocking the camera just a little bit. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, keep going on that. That was great. So, so yeah, we've got to constantly be evaluating, right, in yeah. our mind. Is what we're doing working? If it is, great, let's kind of double down on it and see if we can ride it to victory. And if it's not, what adjustments do we need to make? Um, and then, you know, so, again, the practice versus game thing, that's something we have to train because you can't just go out there and expect to – make real time adjustments as quickly as they need to be made in you know, relatively short sets and short matches. Uh, if you haven't sort of trained that concept, right. I and then that. post game, our, our mentality is, uh, you know, kind of a quick debrief. What did we feel coming right off the court? What were we thinking in certain situations and you know, what worked, what didn't work, and, you know, just kind of try and catalog that a little bit for the next time we meet said opponent. Cool. Cool. You know, when I was talking with Karch, shout out to Karch Karai, uh, <laughs> um, he was talking about adjustments. And, and I asked him, you know, you know, what was some of his mindsets over the years? And he was just like, I was constantly making adjustments, you know, and if you're not making adjustments, you're just you're just behind, you know, and I think a lot of the youth athletes out there need to kind of get better at that in that moment of not being so reflective or so visualization for the future, but just making the adjustment on the other side, kind of the other thing he was talking about was like a puzzle. It's like a puzzle and you're just trying to figure it out. Well, yeah, there's, well, because there's a, <clears throat> there's this constant evolution, right? Cause mm -hmm. you and I play each other and let's say you win. And so my job is to figure out what adjustments I need to make to beat you. And right. maybe you stick with what worked in beating me there, but conceivably, hopefully, you know, from my perspective, I figure out the right adjustments 
I end up beating you, but now it's on you to make those, you know, I mean, this yeah, seesaw yeah. battle that, I mean, hopefully is ratcheting us all up in level, but if you don't make those adjustments, you're going to be stuck at the bottom of that, that seesaw, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's carry that a little further. And can you give us a glimpse of some self-talk and, you know, self-talk meaning like in the actual moment of competition, you know, what is going on in the mind? Is it, I know we're talking about like, uh, you know, the, you know, solving the puzzle or, and making these adjustments, but is the self-talk like confidence building technical stuff? Um, you know, what, what does the self-talk look like a little bit? Yeah, I, uh, Again, that wasn't really necessarily that big of a part of of my game, and it's okay. you know it is very uh, kind of abstract in that there's no there's no right answer, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I felt like for me that's kind of a routine thing, you know. Like we talk about routines a lot as it pertains to you know serving, for example. You want a good service routine so that you know zero zero looks just like. 24 all or you know whatever 13 all in the fifth um and i think with self-talk uh that concept is important as well in that i would engage in a lot of communication with my teammates as to you know what row we're in uh, if we're in serve receive you know hey i got this same you got you know this ball or whatever with kind of this pre-talk and then, you know, like kind of once we have that quiet moment when the person's about to serve, just, I don't know, trying to relax. There's really not much talk at all, just good breathing. But what was important in that whole equation was the consistency of routine. Yes. Right. So that you're not rushed into serve, receive. Let's say, let's just use that as an example. You're not rushed into action. And so there's this frantic energy. You want to be as calm as possible just so that you can more easily revert to your muscle memory and your training. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Uh, most champions I speak with are all about calm, staying calm, finding the calm, doing whatever it takes, whether it's breathing or, you know, thinking of something to just get them calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, let's let's, Oh yeah. Actually, I wanted to ask you about stoppage time uh, in our sport in volleyball, beach volleyball, indoor volleyball, there is so much stoppage time right after every whistle or during timeouts um how do you how do you guys utilize stoppage time um other than strategy because i get that part but there's so much that stoppage time you know yeah we have less of it in beach volleyball because we don't have like the technical timeouts we have the one but we don't have uh, eight and 16 um yeah we uh we just use it to sort of reassess you know what i mean i was talking about that math of adjustment mm-hmm uh, and it's a good opportunity for us to kind of talk through as a, as a three person team, instead of trying to have little pieces of com uh, communication in between whistles, you know, now we have a full minute or 90 seconds or whatever it is to hash that out a little bit. Uh, and, and, and yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. My guys are, are particularly good at taking the reins in those discussions uh, you know, because my preference is to defer to them on all matters strategic, uh, just in that they, they're the ones out there seeing what they're seeing on the court. So that's really the most pertinent information to us, right? If I have something that is glaringly different than what they think they're seeing, I'll say it. But uh, I like to defer to the, the people who actually have to go out and <laughs> act <laughs> rather than me sitting around going, you should have run that line shot down or, you know, whatever. It is. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah. I just to build on that. So how much of that time is right here, right now in the present moment, how much of that time is reflection on what just happened and how much of that time is let's set up what's going to happen next. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's probably equal parts, all of that. Cool. We will sort of close a timeout with, uh, Hey, what do we want to do out of this time out? So you it? get a little bit oh, of that yeah. reflection, a little bit. What are we going to do right now? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You hear all that. Yeah. I, I got some of that. Yeah. The, the Wi-Fi is Fine. a little spotty. Uh, yeah. 
so we we do a little bit of reflection what's gotten us to this point and then what do we want to do coming out of the timeout yeah so like equal parts basically equal parts yeah yeah that's great that's great uh let's rich let's move into emotion emotion is a big part of this whole equation what are the differences and similarities in emotion from both an inspired practice and an inspired game I'm not sure I understand the question. What's the, what's the similarity in emotion to what? Uh, yeah. So like, um, <clears throat> I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, the whole idea is to try to get to the inspired game. Right. But yeah. what are the similarities in the inspired practice to the inspired game and how does it carry over emotionally? Hmm. I, I don't know. I ever thought about it like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's all right. I, I would, be uh if you have an inspired game there's got to be some satisfaction and some pride taken in having driven yourself to inspired practice in order to accomplish that you know what i mean that's like one of your, yeah your success things like success is putting in work and seeing the fruits of that labor right and so the inspired game would be a result of lots of inspired practice, I would think. And so there would be a yeah. lot of uh, joy in that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got you. And how does the inspired feeling transcend one's sport or discipline and carry over to their personal life? Uh, I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I speculate maybe that, um, yeah, approaching anything you do with, that mindful repetition yeah. uh, sort of idea is going to give you more satisfaction than just going through the motions in any given um, place. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. I guess it can carry over that way just in, in sort of the discipline element. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I know these questions are kind of like, it's tough to think about a little bit because it's, we, we, we as athletes, as coaches, we, we don't really think about these things, but for the kids, for the youth, for the up and coming athletes, you know, I, I think it really is important to start thinking about, you know, how, if I'm really into a sport and I'm fired up, you know, um, and I'm maybe I'm doing well at a sport and I'm just feeling that good feeling, maybe I'm winning, you know, and how can I, how can I carry that over to, you know, be a business person or, or be a teacher or, or do doing something away from sports. That's kind of what I was looking for. Yeah. It's important to be, uh, to have some, level of passion for yeah. anything you do, I would think. Right. Cause it's Absolutely. hard to, it's hard to be inspired in something you don't really care about on, <laughs> on a certain right. level. Right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. All, it's all, it's easy with sport cause we gravitate toward the sport that we love to play. Um, so it's a little bit easier with that, but it's important to remember why we chose our sport. Yeah. Right. When we're looking at what we want to do with our lives, like it's going to be a lot easier for us to have that inspired sort of feeling if we actually care about what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Let, let's talk about flow. Flow is also a big part of this equation. And I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on it. Can you identify when you are in the game, in the flow or in the zone? Can I identify it? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I can think of uh, twice it happened in my I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, do you want to know how I identified? Is that what the question is? Yeah, well, actually, I was just curious if you can identify it. And it's funny you said twice because it, it is rare. It's a rare yeah. thing, you know? Well, yeah. I, I don't know. Beach volleyball is maybe a little bit easier to identify. Like my, my position as a, a libero indoors it's not like, you know, playing basketball where you're handling the ball and shaking defenders and scoring and all that stuff. Like it's a, obviously a specialized position. So it's a little bit harder to identify, like in those terms, at least like, Oh, I'm in the zone or I'm sure. in the flow, whatever you can just go. Yeah, I'm kind of dialed in today. I'm playing well or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of, you know, I think of it more like if a, if a guy's throwing a no hitter, you don't really talk about it. I mean, when you, once you start right. going, oh, I'm in the zone, that's when you're starting to slip out of the zone, I would guess. Interesting. No, I yes. think you're absolutely right. 
just kind of uh, quietly embrace it if, if you feel like that's happening and try and ride it out because, yeah, as you mentioned, it is fleeting, unfortunately. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, let me ask you this. Can you practice that? Is it possible to practice that feeling or does it just come? Yeah, I think it just comes uh, because, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's possible to identify what what you did to get that in that in that zone on any given day it's just like we were saying our performance day in and day out is going to fluctuate just you know by nature of us being uh imperfect human beings sure right but we can going back to the whole you play the way you practice or whatever inspired practice leads to inspired games the more you train the more concerted effort and and sort of pointed practice you put in the more likely you are to attain that flow and that zone, whatever more frequently. Yeah, I agree. Agree. And okay. So let's, let's say you're in practice or even, even as, as a coach, you know, and you're watching your guys practice, let's say uh, you're in the, you're in the flow in practice. Is it possible to bank that feeling and then try to access it later in the game? Mm, yeah, I don't, I don't know that it is. I mean, I'd be willing to listen to debate on the other side, but I'm not right. sure how you, how you bank the feeling of being in the zone. I mean, yeah. I guess, I guess I understand what you're getting at, right? Like you want to catalog it. So if it comes around again, you recognize the feeling that's what you're saying. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm, I'm asking. Cause I'm not saying, I'm not sure, you know? Yeah. I suppose that that, that's uh possible and maybe even a, a probable theory concept mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know that's one of the ways that that I liked being coached when I was coached and that I try and emulate a little bit in the way I speak with my athletes which is we want to focus on the good reps you know too often I think we can harp on the negative a little bit as coaches like oh you know don't make that mistake or you're doing this wrong or blah, blah, blah. But I kind of prefer to go the other way with it. Hey, here's this jump serve that you just hit really well. Let's remember that feeling. Remember right. what that toss looked like. Remember what that approach felt like. And remember, you know, I don't know what, what your contact point was, whatever. Uh, but yeah, groove that feeling and seek to attain that feeling. And it probably is similar with that concept of being in the zone, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The groove, that feeling. I like that phrase. That's, that's good. Yeah. Because I, I've, I look, this is a challenge, you know, it's not easy to just be like, yeah, I'm going to be in the flow. I'm going to bank it. I'm going to be, I'm going to access it at game point. You know, that's, that's unrealistic, but I think for me, and again, for this project, it's something that's worth starting to think about, you know, it's like, maybe there are, maybe there are, there are ways that I can maybe start to bank certain things like that. I can, I can bank the feeling of, oh yeah, I was really in the groove at that one practice. I'm going to try to remember how that felt. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I know it's, it's a, it's definitely a inquisitive thing for me. I'm trying to figure out what other people think about that. Um, Let's, let's move on. Let's talk about sources. Rich, where do you get inspiration from? Yeah, like I was talking about early on, uh, I get inspiration from people around me. You know, uh, Jake's an inspiring guy. An inspiring guy. I've got a few friends that are uh, very inspirational to me on different levels. Uh, so I, I get it from the people around me. Love that. Love that. Uh, how do you stay inspired when you're away from the game? Uh, well, yeah, I just do other things that I like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, we, we spend so much time around the game that being away from the game is, it makes it easy to sort of put it volleyball on the back shelf, you know, and, and just kind of focus on other things. Yeah. Um, and, and before we move on, I just want to ask if you have any advice for the youth athlete out there right now who's struggling with staying away from it um, and, and struggling with finding inspiration outside of the game, during, especially during this quarantine time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
I know it's tough. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I have any any tips for how to deal with quarantine. I can't imagine as a as a kid having school and just junior sports and all that stuff taken away from you. Uh, right. That's got to be terrible. Um, but you know, hypothetically, once we get back to normal life, um, I, I would look for interests outside. You know. If you can play other sports, I think that's very helpful. I mean, we have too much kind of specialization or single sport athletes or whatever in our in our country anymore, right? And what I find, well, I, I shouldn't say I find this like I've done some study. What I feel like can happen a lot is, is kids get burnt out. Right. You, you know, I don't know when you started playing volleyball, but I didn't start until I was in high school. Mm-hmm. So – you know, by the time I got to college, it was only like my fourth year of playing. Oh, wow. Or whatever, right? You know, and so uh, kids nowadays are starting nine, ten years old playing, you know, school and club all the way through. So they're at like eight, nine years of volleyball before they even get to college. And like, I don't know, you're, you're starting to get bored with it if it's been your whole life for almost a decade, right? And you're really just now getting into anything important or <laughs> exciting or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. So you're saying like, go play other sports, go do other things. Right. Yeah. Don't, you know, I mean, don't put all your eggs in, in one basket because if that's the only place your inspiration comes from, then without it, you're, you're sort of lost. Right. I like that. Uh, and so, like yeah, that. if it's another, if you just love sports, another sports, great. If you love painting or something, you know, other disciplines, yeah. yeah, other disciplines, just things to, yeah, I don't know. That's one thing I feel like we've all learned from uh, quarantine is we love our loved ones, but being around them nonstop with no break is going to cause us to murder at least one of our family <laughs> members, right? For sure. And, and so it's important, like normal life allows us the opportunity to go, you know, elsewhere for inspiration to, you know, make it an answer to your question, but just allows us to sort of not be so hyper-focused on one thing and get burned out by that thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. Yeah. Um, cool. Awesome. Um, dude, let's move into the lightning round again. Answer these how you want. If you want, if you have stories or anything, that's totally cool. How do you define success and what does being successful mean to you? Yeah, I think success is just, accomplishing what you set out to accomplish. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, that it doesn't have to be monetary, uh, yeah. but I think, you know, setting a goal and achieving that goal is a good definition of success. Yep. I agree with that. How do you consider the idea of failure? How do I consider it? Yeah. How do you uh, consider it? Yeah. It's, it's hurtful. Uh, in in beach volleyball, it's really quite interesting because, you know, I mean, you tend to play a couple matches a day, so you could have a loss uh, or a failure to win, if you will. <laughs> and if you don't do a good job of getting past that, you're going to have lingering effect in your next in your next match, right? So um, I view it as something that has to be uh, considered very short term. Mm. Uh, okay. Obviously, there's some fluctuation in the scale, right? If you lose the Olympic finals, you know, that hurts a little more than losing round one of the, you know, Austin Open or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, there's some fluctuation there. But I think if you expect to be successful in life, you have to take from any given failure uh, – what's going to benefit you mm, there we and go. move on quickly. Love that. I love that. Yeah. I feel like a lot of youth athletes really need to hear that message. Like take that loss, learn from it, move on from it quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Newsflash. It's going to happen a lot. <laughs> right. So. Uh, okay, cool. What are the most successful habits that you do on a consistent basis? Mm, my most successful habits. Yeah, probably my most successful habit nowadays is I, I exercise pretty regularly. 
um, you know, that's a place that I've found I enjoy and a place to, you know, put a lot of my attention since I'm not, you know, a volleyball player anymore. Um, and so, you know, when we're not in practice, I like to dedicate my, my efforts there. So that's kind of where most of my habits lie, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, how do you fire up when, when you don't feel fired up to go exercise? Uh, you, you know, I, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was a kid, I had the Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedia of bodybuilding and, uh, it's a little bit, you know, I mean, it's obviously a bunch of like workout stuff, but there was a little bit of, uh, autobiography and, and background on Schwarzenegger. And he said that he oftentimes found his best days of lifting were days he felt tired or did, days like he felt like he didn't want to be at the gym. And, you know, so getting yourself just to, to move in a situation where you don't want to move is oftentimes all it takes. And then you kind of get into it, you know, again, to that attitude piece, like you can just get yourself to go, you know, Hey, this is something that's going to make me my 1% better today and just get yourself to start it. It usually kicks in. Love that. I love that. I needed to hear that myself. So that's great. <laughs> um, what's one word that best describes you and why? Um, yeah, I, I would probably go with sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if those are the kind of words you're looking for, but no, that's fine. That, hey, that's, that's funny. I, cause I always think of a word for all of my guests and I'll tell you that word in a second, but I just wanted to let you finish that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I grew up in a very sarcastic environment and I don't know. It's a, preferred brand of humor i guess <laughs> i think it's a strength of yours man when i listen to you on the broadcast for amazon prime it's fun to listen to oh i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, the like word it's fun yeah yeah absolutely uh the word i came up for you uh is versatile you know i, I played uh libero myself and you know i i i found out you were an outside hitter first and then you became a, a, a libero and now you're a beach coach uh for the number one team in the united states does that word resonate with you? Versatile? Uh, yeah. I, I don't know that it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, no, I, the way you characterize it, I appreciate that. I don't know that I would have ever assigned myself that word, though. Okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's but that's what's interesting about this exercise. Is yeah. It's always interesting to see how other people see you or think of you, right? Yeah. And, and broadcasting skills too. I mean, that's a lot of skills right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. It's mostly just pretending anyone cares what I have to say. <laughs> In my mind, it's going super well. <laughs> I love that. That's hilarious. Um, cool. Let's keep moving on for you. What is the most important lesson that has helped shape who you are today? And most I, while well, yeah, and I know while you're thinking, I know it's a tough question for a lightning round. It doesn't have to be one lesson, but just anything that comes to mind that has helped shape you. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, uh, I would probably revert to a couple of those concepts we talked about before, right? Greatness not being a switch, uh, that kind of stuff. If you're not getting better, you're getting worse. Um, yeah. And so just yeah, really, I don't know, that was always a reminder to me about the importance of, of dedication. Uh, to one's craft. Love that. Love that. Can you share the biggest challenge you've been through on your journey? The biggest challenge or another tough one. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, this isn't like a, uh, an individual challenge. Um, it's, it's more of a, a group challenge, I think, mm -hmm. but I don't know. I'll give you the quick version of this because okay. uh, I oftentimes, you know, in 2008, we, we were able to win the gold. Right. And so when you achieve a success, I think people, especially people unfamiliar with your situation, don't realize the, the bumps in the road that you face along the way, right. The ups and downs, 
along that road to the ultimate success. And you tend to get this revisionist history version of mm. things oftentimes, right? You, like we start with the conclusion almost. We start with the end line. They want a gold medal. And then once you go backwards, you only find evidence that supports like, yeah, we always knew that was going to happen. <laughs> but in reality, our road to 08 went 2005. We had a pretty good summer. 2006 was terrible and things were fracturing on our team. And luckily our coach was a rock and, and stuck to his guns and stuck to his plan and knew what he was doing. And then 2007 started trending upwards again uh, because of that strength in our coach. Um, and then, you know, and then, like I said, in 08, it, it ended how it ended, but uh, that was the 06 was probably the biggest challenge because we'd come off a successful summer the year before where we beat Brazil in Brazil, the team that had just won gold in Athens um, with like a ragtag crew, you know, it was this great, great uplifting thing. And we thought we were just going to keep rolling and we didn't and things could have fallen apart, but they didn't fortunately, thanks to uh, our coach. And yeah, anyways. I love that. No, I, I really love that. What, the the visual that was coming up for me as you're telling me that is, have you seen that photo or that idea of like the iceberg and everyone just kind of sees the tip, but like there's this yeah. huge right. part of the iceberg that's under the water that no one sees. Uh huh. Yeah. That, that was just coming up for me as you're telling me that. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, of course we're never, you know, unless we get the uh, 10 part docuseries, like we get mm -hmm. on the bowls right now. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to know like the day in and day out of anybody else's success. Right. 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 Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, as a coach, Rich, what is the biggest challenge you see for your athletes? Well, <laughs> I mean, now the biggest challenge for my athletes and probably every athlete is like re-engaging. You know, we haven't been training volleyball at all i mean because beaches are closed and all that kind of stuff but also we're in this holding pattern where we don't even know when the first event would be you know and so our lives went from being so regimented in hey the first tournament is march whatever so we start january 1st and here's this week in week out plan of how we're building to that <clears throat> excuse me right uh, right but uh now like we don't know when that first date is you know we had gone through a preseason we actually played in Doha Qatar uh, <laughs> up until the day the travel ban was instituted wow yeah but you know we thought the season was kicking off and a couple things had been canceled it wasn't the the wasteland that it is now um, and so we we thought we were going we were looking at three months until the Olympic cutoff and all that kind of stuff and now everything's a year back, which, you know, I mean, it gets more and more difficult when you're 44 years old and stuff like that. So uh, the mental part of this whole thing is the biggest challenge for us, I believe. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. How important is the idea of having impact to you? Uh, I, I don't know that it's all that important to me in that it's not a driving factor. Sure. Um, I, I hope I have an impact on whoever I work with. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't imagine my guys would keep me around if there was <laughs> no impact. Um, but yeah, it's not, I'm not looking for like any kind of credit so to speak, any like pat on the back, um, you know, and, and a parade announcing the impact. I had. <laughs> right. No, I get it. I, it's funny talking to champions because, you know, most champions are just focused on their craft, focused on what they're doing. The impact stuff is for everyone else to kind of judge, kind of like legacy right. kind of stuff, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That's it. Well, it's just, it's actually nice to hear that. Um, over and over again, because uh, it goes back to focus, right? Like you don't want to think about that stuff so much. You want to just stay focused in your lane. And then again, like I just said, let other people 
talk about that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, what brings you joy? What part of your work brings you the most joy? Oh. Right now, diet A and W brings me <laughs> joy. <laughs> what brings me joy? Yeah, I um, I mean, I suppose my guys being successful uh, is very joyful. <clears throat> But I mean, kind of like we talked about with the notion of failure, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, especially in the beach volleyball world where you kind of go, you know, we have a tournament this weekend and then a tournament next weekend and so forth. Uh, we talked about getting what you can out of failure and moving past it quickly. The same is true for us with successful results as well. You want to enjoy it briefly you want to certainly uh, catalog the things you did to attain that success but you can't just dwell on it forever you got to get on to the next the next thing um and so success of my guys brings me joy yeah uh, but it's not something we dwell on not something cool. i dwell on i should say yeah you're like moving on right you like it you feel the joyful feeling and it's like on to the next right yeah right I got you. That's awesome. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received and why from who? The best piece of advice. Hmm. What's the best piece of advice you ever got? <laughs> I love that. Way to pull it. Way to throw it right back to me. That's great. Um, well, I, I, I'm a quote guy. I'm a book guy. So, you know, all this stuff right here, but especially that one, uh, the, the Gandhi, you know, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. Um, I know it wasn't directly to me, you know, but that's, I take that as advice to me that I try to do that every day. The 1% better thing is something I live by. I have it on my wrist all the time. Um, but you know, be committing to the, being the best version of myself, uh, is a piece of advice that I try to live my life by. Um, whether it's on the court, whether it's doing a, a, a podcast like this, whether it's interacting with someone, whether it's just living my life, you know, I just try to be the best version of myself. I don't do that quite every day or all the time, but that's the best piece of advice that I've heard. To be the best version of yourself. Yeah. I'm, I'm in shock that I always thought that Gandhi had said that directly to you, but. Oh, really? Oh yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like all those ideas i be the best version of yourself that was advice did you did you need somebody to tell you that or uh it was it, it was <laughs> a nice were, room you're being the worst version of yourself every day <laughs> somebody's like hey i got some advice for you kid <laughs> do the direct opposite of that <laughs> yeah yeah uh you know it's a good question number one uh it does make you think but in terms of advice, um, yeah, how about, how about this one? How about, like, follow what makes you joyful and makes you happy? Like, for me, life is supposed to be fun. It's, you're not supposed to not have fun. So it was like, go follow that stuff. Um, for me also, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this, actually. When I was, um, when I was a teenager uh, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, um, I, I was a baseball player. And I was... I was pretty good. I, I, I wanted to be a Dodger. Uh, I, was, I wanted to be a shortstop for the Dodgers. That was my thing. But I, I remember playing and that inspired feeling that we were talking about earlier. I, I remember like feeling the, the tingles on the back of my neck. Um, don't mean to be TMI or anything, but like I, I remember that feeling like, oh, yeah, I'm in the flow. I'm doing what I love to do. I'm feeling so good. So I gave the advice to myself, which is whatever gives you that feeling, just go ahead and follow that. Nice. This just went full Matthew McConaughey acceptance <laughs> speech. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> He's his own hero and you give yourself your yes. best advice. <laughs> that, that was my younger self giving advice to my older self. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> and I've had great coaches and stuff too. I could, I could talk about, you know, some stuff some coaches would tell me, but I think I would answer that like that. 
<laughs> that dude, I love that. Here's another, here's another story I heard one time that's hilarious that kind of uh, relates to that. Mm -hmm. Rob Schneider. <clears throat> I don't know if you're like a Howard Stern guy or not. But yeah, Rob I like Schneider's, Howard Stern. <laughs> so Rob Schneider's on Howard Stern's show and he's talking about uh, somehow the topic of Steven Seagal came up and kind of okay. what, a, what a maniac that guy is. Okay. Rob Schneider goes, I did a movie with him, with Steven Seagal one time. And uh, he like summons me to his trailer and it's like this two room trailer, right? So Rob's like sitting in the, uh, the waiting room, whatever. And Steven Seagal comes out and goes, I just read the greatest script I've ever read. And Rob goes, oh, really? That's cool. Who wrote it? He goes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who gave you your best advice you've ever heard? I did. Myself. <laughs> no, I, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, here's the other thing I would, I would say to that. Um, the inspired feeling, the, this whole idea of, of what is inspiration mean it's like we pull advice from all around us we like we pull it from our friends our our coaches our teammates our these all, books these people these, these iconic figures um i think it's really up to us uh oh there we go there we go my friend aaron aaron felton shout out aaron felton he told me the best advice i've ever heard and i'm going to share it with you right now because you got me thinking about it so great job okay uh a santa monica guy aaron felton awesome guy. He told me one time, he looked right at me and he said, you know what, Aaron? It's all up to you. And I'll never forget that because everything is up to you. It's how you want to perceive things. It's, it's, it's how you want to go about your life. It's how you, do you want to be inspired? Do you want to be uninspired? Do you even want to think about that stuff? Um, everything is up to you. Your relationship with money, your relationship with love, your, your relationships in general, uh, your relationship to you and your younger self and your older self and your place in the world. It's all up to you. We have that choice in every moment. So that is the best advice I've ever heard. Awesome. Now all my jokes about you congratulating yourself. You just smashed them. <laughs> smashed it right there. No, you did a good job because you made me think of that because, uh, because that's, that's even better than what I, I, I would tell myself about the little tingles. <laughs> you just have to switch. It's all up to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, now it's your turn. You got you to answer that. All right. Yeah. I'm trying to think if I had a moment like that where somebody, somebody told me it's all up to me. Uh, yeah, I, man, I don't know that I have anything good for you on the advice. That's okay. I just, uh, I mean, there are some of those concepts like, like greatness isn't a switch. Uh, yeah, I mean, those are like things that really, I don't know, resonate well with me. So it's not, those weren't given as advice necessarily. I really like that are, one. That one resonates yeah. with me. That's cool. They are kind of, uh, some good some good guidelines for how to operate and, and you can kind of apply them in a lot of different, a lot of different places. Right. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I, uh, I, I got to play for a guy named Carl McGowan. If mm -hmm. you're familiar BYU. With him. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and so he was, he was really great. You know, he was a big quote guy like yourself and we'd have quotes up on the board all the time. And uh, one, he liked to go back to, quite frequently was the yesterday is history tomorrow's a mystery and you know today's a gift that's why it's called the present I, I like I like that concept again that's not advice per se but uh, um, I, I just really like that idea of kind of being in the here and now yeah I love that um, it actually makes me think of a quote from Kobe and I, I want to ask you about Kobe in a second but uh, he said something like greatness is to inspire the person next to you. And I, I really like that. Um, especially coming from someone as great as him. Um, th does that resonate with you at all? Kobe said that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I wonder if his teammates think he accomplished that. <laughs> I, I do. I do like that idea. <laughs> Uh, and I think Kobe was a great player and I loved, uh, retired, like figured it out 
Kobe, but the the revisionist uh, stuff we get into with him about like him being like the ultimate competitor when I, I don't know. I don't again. I don't know that any teammates were <laughs> super stoked on his Mamba mentality. <laughs> he was intense for sure. Yeah, it's just. I mean, it's interesting. Like that's such an interesting game, basketball, because it's a team sport, but one transcendent person can really take things over right yeah so it's kind of like like they say baseball is the an individual sport masquerading as a team sport but there are elements of that in basketball as well i would think yeah no you're absolutely right i think the biggest thing about kobe is is that for me anyway um is that yes he was kind of like super intense on the court but i think the the the, the biggest reason why he was so impactful on um on the world we saw that with his you know with his unfortunate passing is it's what he did after that, you know, it's, it's what it, he, with the Oscar, with the coaching, you know, being a girl dad um, and just kind of trying to commit to being the best version of himself. I think a lot of people connected with that. Yeah, I would agree with you there for sure. And did you ever have any run-ins with him in, uh, in Beijing? In the Olympics? Uh, we, well, yeah, we saw those guys a bunch, but uh, Kobe was actually – probably the coolest of all those guys cool um just real you know engaging and uh unfortunately and bizarrely that's not always the case you would think that if you're at the olympics like all the kind of athletes have this camaraderie but like those guys are stars on such a different level that it's i I think it's probably difficult for them to just shut it off and be kind of normal people but Kobe Kobe was pretty much like that like super cool especially to the U.S. athletes and we uh right after the Olympics we got to go to this Oprah Winfrey show she had all the medalists I think and you know we're in this park in Chicago or whatever Mm -hmm. and the dream the dream team you know uh was obviously the focus of who she was talking to but yeah Kobe was super cool there too awesome Awesome. All right. Just, I just got a few more here for you, Rich. Um, you might not like me for this question, but I'm going to, I'm going to shoot for it anyway. What is your ultimate why? Uh, as it pertains to what? I had a feeling you were going to ask me that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as it pertains to anything, uh, as a athlete, as a coach, as a human being, um, as a man, you know, sports, outside of sports, however you want to take that. Hmm. And, and while you're thinking it begs the question, why not? And I'm, I'm well aware of that. Um, but you know, you, you inspire me because of many different reasons, but, um, not just your, your accolades and your, your successes, but how you're giving back. You know, so maybe you can answer it like that. Like, why? Why are you even doing what you're doing now? Uh, yeah, my why on that front is uh, that I love the game. I, I love uh, the opportunity I've had to kind of learn mm. in beach volleyball. That's cool. Uh, because, you know, I played plenty during the summers just living in California, but Certainly, I didn't play on a professional level on the beach. And so, you know, at the at the elite level of the sport, there's so much that goes into it tactically and training-wise and, you know, strategically. Um, so that's all stuff that I've had to learn and I'm, I'm still learning day in and day out. Uh, and so the opportunity to learn the opportunity to stay involved with the sport and the opportunity to work with, uh, two guys that I love a lot is, uh, is my why I think. That's awesome. No, I I love that. That's great. Um, looking back on your journey, is there anything you wish you could change and why? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would change. I would, yeah. I would change that, uh, like I myself would be a better teammate, especially sort of later in my later in my career. Um, 
yeah, like I'm a, I, I consider myself a really good team player, but I don't know that being a good team player and a good teammate uh, are the same thing. Because, like, I think I was one and not necessarily the other a lot. You know what I mean? Uh, I like kind of know what you mean, but could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so a good team player, as I would define it, is somebody who fulfills their role well on any given team, whatever that role is. If you're Clay Stanley and your role is to bomb aces and just club D balls, then, like, then that's what you do. But mm-hmm. my role was different than that. And so, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't like an attention seeking guy. Uh, I just wanted to do my job mm-hmm. and, you know, support the team as best I could. And so I think that made me a good team player, but as we kind of, as, as my career went on, you know, there's younger guys that come in and like the culture had kind of shifted and, you know, whatever things were different than what I was accustomed to. And I don't know that I adapted well, tried to help guys assimilate. Well, you know, got the most out of my teammates that I could have maybe. Yeah. So the things made me not the greatest teammate, although I was still a good team player. Cool. No, that's, that's actually really well said. Um, I don't know if you have the pyramids in front of you and you don't have to look right now, but basically the idea of those pyramids is those are roadmaps. Um, you know, John Wooden's roadmap was obviously really successful for him and his teams. You know, this, this um, uh, pyramid of inspired living for me is my roadmap. Um, would you recommend or uh, would you, would you, would you have your athletes, let's say, let's say Taylor and Jake, or anyone listening out there, would you recommend that they make their own roadmap for themselves? Uh, if you want to, I mean, if that's how you want to look at it, I think that's important because, I mean. Kind of like goal setting a little bit. Yeah, that's that's how I would consider it, right? Yeah. You have to have your big goals, but then you've got to have little goals along the way. Otherwise, kind of like we were talking about, in my playing level versus Phil, like the gap there is too, too large to comprehend. Right. But if I can just try and get, you know, to that hurdle and that hurdle and that hurdle, I can chip away at it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I do need some sort of roadmap on the way to my ultimate goals. Yeah. Or like a compass. And I just feel like, uh, you know, so many youth athletes don't have a compass like that. They're just cruising. You know, and so that's why I was asking if you uh, if if you would give that advice out. Would you say, hey, write down your goals, or like let's say let's say there's a uh, someone on the the national team or a junior national team, and they, and they want to be the next the next Rich Lamborn. Would would you tell them, hey, like write down what what your goal is, and then try to create the roadmap to get there? Uh, yeah, I also don't think that like. Uh that serious of an approach needs to be taken with kids that are too young. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause kind of yeah, like yeah. we talked about not having diversity in your interests uh, and making things too hyper serious, I, I think takes the fun away from the game takes, uh, I don't know, the ability to continue having that mindful repetition mindset, mm-hmm. you know? So while I do think the concept of goal setting and having a map, along the way to that goal is very important. I also think um, there's sort of a time and a place for it, right? I don't know that, yeah, I don't know what the what the age would be. Right. But I mean, I'm pretty sure if I'm 12 years old and someone's telling me how to, you know, roadmap my way to college volleyball, like that's just too, I think that's, too serious <laughs> like yeah like more just have fun with it right now right yeah i mean have fun learning the game yeah find joy in just playing the game and figuring things out uh you know there's plenty of time to get serious i like that no that's that's actually great advice um cool last question having achieved the peak of athletic achievement with your gold medal what does fulfillment mean to you? Uh, 
Hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now it's fulfillment is uh, largely accomplishment and success with my guys. Like that's where I, I find fulfillment. Um, putting in work and, and feeling like we're the best version of ourselves. Um, not to steal your <laughs> lingo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if we're, if we're out there firing on all cylinders and, and just doing the best that we're capable of doing, then, then that's uh, fulfilling for us because, you know, I mean, obviously we believe that if that's happening, then we're going to have some successes to go alongside that. Right. Uh, but the fulfillment comes in just leaving it all out there. Absolutely. Well, Rich, I think we both left it all out there today during this talk. <laughs> so uh, I can't thank you enough for making some time to, to get a little glimpse of your mindset and your thoughts and all this stuff. I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, absolutely. And once again, uh, just in case people want to check you out, your IG is at Richie USA. That's at R-I-C-H-Y-U-S-A on Instagram and Twitter. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks again, Rich. And um, right. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bro. All right, buddy. All right. Bye. This episode is brought to you by DAF Global. If you're looking to start a podcast or you have a podcast and you're looking for editing services, hit up my guys, Oliver and Garrett at DAF Global. They're awesome. They help me with this podcast and they take care of all kinds of different services like editing and audio enhancement. And they're great to work with. They're also offering a 10% discount to all within the game listeners. So hit my guys up at DAF Global on Instagram and also on their website, www.dafglobal.com dot co dot uk